It's wonderful to be with you this morning. I'm excited about so many people being presented, baptism, confirmation, reception, reaffirmation. I met with all those candidates just prior to the service, and I said to them, you know, this is a courageous thing that you are doing, and it is. We live presently in a world that is becoming more and more suspicious of genuine religious commitment. The preference for many of the people that you and I know is not that we would not have religious faith, although there are some people who think it rather ridiculous, if not delusional, in fact. But rather that those, public, those inner Christian commitments would not be brought to bear in terms of how we think about who we are as citizens, who we are as family members, how they inform our moral decisions, our political choices, the way we order our life, the way we handle money, the way we think about our future. The preference for many is that religious faith would be strictly a private affair and have no bearing on how we act in the public arena, even if the public arena is true for, is maybe just our own family. And in fact, the, the, the kind of phrase that gets said over and over again when you begin to bring religious conviction into those kinds of conversations is, well, you know, that might be true for you, but I have my truth, you have your truth. As if somehow truth itself was malleable, could be shaped according to, you know, what you think versus what I think. Christian conviction says something very different from that. Christian conviction says that truth has been expressed clearly in the person and work of Jesus Christ, who said, I am the truth. That means how we think about things is in fact measured by the plumb line of what Jesus says. And the task for Christians is to wrestle with the teachings of Jesus as well as the rest of the scripture and say, okay, let's work together because it takes all of us to do this. How do we find a way to live this out? Especially in those places where it might feel less popular or not popular at all. I mean, we live in a global communion as Anglicans where Christian brothers and sisters are people that either we know or have heard about or that it's global. It's not just sort of, you know, us hanging out here at, in Lakanto. We're a part of something that literally spans the globe as well as space and time. Uh, that's why we say just prior to the Eucharist, therefore with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. Well, who are we talking about? We're talking about faithful, believing witnesses down through the ages who, as is written in Hebrews, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, literally, as it were, the picture is they're looking down from the grandstands, looking at us on the arena of life, as it were, and says, we're praying for you, we're rooting for you, now it's your turn. What will you do? What will you do with this Christian life and faith? And therefore, to enter into that kind of challenge, and it is in fact a challenge, requires a certain level of courage. A willingness to do the hard work of trying to bring the very tenor of my life in line with the life and teachings of Jesus Christ. And getting with other people and wrestling with this together. You know why I need other people? Well, there are plenty of reasons, actually, why I need other people. But more often than not, when it comes to especially the more thorny issues, I have a tendency either to let myself off the hook when it gets a little uncomfortable, or actually treat myself too harshly. Both seem to happen. And therefore, the witness and the encouragement and the prayers and the counsel of other people is incredibly important. That's why when we will be reaffirming lots of commitments that we make within the context of baptism and confirmation, we will say, among other things, we will, notice, because we need to find a way to do this together. 
That's one of the purposes, in fact, of the local church. Not just a place where I show up on Sunday and get a little, in essence, my little piece of grace, and then I go back into my life, but rather I'm a part of a body of people that are wrestling together about what does it mean to be Christian, and how do I bring that Christian faith to bear in my neighborhoods, in the places where I live, the places where I serve. In other words, what does the Christian faith have to say about life in Citrus County? Whether we're talking about issues of public policy, whether we're talking about how the government is run, you know, there's, there really is no place in the Christian life for, as I said, you know, you have your faith, but this is business. While that's often the way it gets lived out, that's not a part of the gospel. In fact, it's in fact in contradiction to the gospel because the earth is the Lord's. So the question for me as I'm wrestling this morning with these texts is, and especially within the context of the Christian commitments that people are going to be making and that we who say we are already Christian are reaffirming is, what does it take to live like that? What does it take to live with that kind of courage, that kind of poise, that kind of powerful and yet gentle confidence that no matter where I am, whether I'm in this building, or whether I'm at the convenience store down the street getting my gas, or whether I'm showing up at Granny's Diner in Crystal River to have my breakfast, or you fill in the blank, on all of those places, I'm a consistently, God being my helper, a believer in Jesus Christ, and someone willing and committed to being that faithful believer within all of those contexts doesn't mean I always get it right. In fact, just the opposite. We, we can be assured of the fact that we will not always get it right. That's a part of what it means to be sinful people. So, and that's why we need forgiveness, right? If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, First John says. So we're all in this one together. But it also, John also says, if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, he is at work inside of us, bringing both the good word of God's mercy, but also working within us that which we need to be able to live out this Christian faith. Which is why, for example... Even in this service, you'll see me get out my little container of oil, and I'll be making the sign of the cross on people who are being baptized and confirmed. Why is that? Oil is always a symbol in the scriptures for the presence of the Holy Spirit. In other words, we're asking the Holy Spirit to come in and do something. Because if I'm going to say, I will with God's help, that means I need it, right? We need God's help to do this. Nod your heads. We're in this one together. So what does it take to live with that kind of courage? And what I want to do in a very brief moment is pull a couple of pieces out of the reading from the book of Revelation. The temptation is to go straight to Doubting Thomas because that's the reading for every Sunday after Easter. But I'm only going to briefly reference that because of this. And this is what John writes describing Jesus to the group people receiving it. It's important because this is a group of people suffering genuine persecution. Think ISIS persecuting Christians in the Middle East. That's what we're talking about here. In other words, they are in a life and death situation. What is said to a group of people in a life and death situation applies to any Christian who is committed to finding a way to serve Jesus even if that invokes a certain level of opposition. So, John writes to them and he says, Grace and peace from him, meaning God, who is, who was, and who is to come. What that says is that there is a great consistency 
in the Godhead that has always been. So that what we see in Jesus when he comes to this planet, when he says the things that he says, when he does the things that he does, that's God in our midst. And that's not just who God revealed himself to be in Jesus. That's who God is always, even now. So what does that mean? That means he's kind. I can trust in him. He loves me. And that's important to know. Why? Because when you're in difficult circumstances, the challenge often is, when things go really badly especially, well, what's happened? Has God forgotten me? Does he really not love me anymore? Have I done something to offend him in a way that causes God to withdraw his presence from me? Or worse, Maybe I've never really believed after all. Nod your head. How many of you for whom that has happened, where you get into tough circumstances and you wind up going, didn't I get it right? Or am I not doing it the correct way? Is God in some way after me? What's really going on? You know the Job questions. A part of what God is, John is saying to these people is, you can count on what you've seen in Jesus. That's true regardless of what's happening within the context of your circumstances. There is an eternal consistency, you see, in the Godhead that is as true right now in this particular day and age as it was when Jesus walked the earth in the first century. Because who is Jesus? He is the faithful witness. In other words, he didn't come down and present God to be something that Jesus is not. He is faithful in what he has declared. He is also, it says of him, the firstborn of the dead. Meaning not only did Jesus come back to life, but those who were asleep in Jesus, to use Paul's phrase, will also be raised from the dead because he's the firstborn of the dead. Which means no matter when I die and under what circumstances that might be, even if it is martyrdom, or for us, the pain of, a life seemingly cut down before its time. Or someone who has walked through the throes of a debilitating illness. You see, in all of those circumstances, if Jesus is the firstborn of the dead, that means when we will gather and celebrate the life of someone who has died, we can say with great confidence, they also are in Jesus. And that he is raising them from the dead. It isn't just, you see, happen to him. He is the firstborn of the dead, and then lastly, the ruler of the kings of the earth. Meaning that even when things go incredibly badly, God is actively at work, and he will redeem even the worst, the worst of what has happened. So he can say, to him who loves us, and literally in the Greek it is, to him who is ever loving us all the time. There's this consistent no change about the love of God. The love of God is not in any way predicated on your behavior. There is no sense when you mess up and God says, oh, I don't want to talk to you today. No, the faithful consistency of God is that his posture towards us is always one of invitation, of love, of a call to draw closer. You see, if I think that in any way my relationship with God is predicated on my behavior, I'm just sunk. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, writes 1 John. Well, guess what? Right? So I need the consistent love of God even in the midst, but especially, you see, in the midst of the ups and downs of what I'm able or not able to do when it comes to behaving rightly. Whoever loves us is always loving us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, meaning no matter what I've done, I can still go to him and I am, in fact, declared forgiven by God. There is nothing that I have done that God turns around and says, oh, that's too big for me. 
or that sin is too strong. It is not worthy of my forgiveness. No, no, no. The posture of God's love is always to receive and forgive. That's really the story of the prodigal son. That's who he is, you see. And that means because I can trust in his character, in his faithfulness, in his goodness, that's actually the thing that enables me to be able to say yes even more deeply. Because I know as I continue to say yes to Christ, more will be asked of me. There is a cost in this. God is looking for people who are willing to be faithful disciples, not just when life's going well, but in the face of those times when life is hard, when life is difficult, when we're asked to do really challenging things, like forgive what feels like the unforgivable, when it feels like being a faithful witness really could be very, very difficult indeed. That's the very thing that God wants to empower and to bless if I didn't know that somehow I could step into even the most difficult situations and know that God would not abandon me or that if I mess up, he wouldn't forgive, I wouldn't take those steps, right? Because that means it's really all up to me and God's looking down to see how well I'm going to do with it all. That's great agnosticism. It is terrible Christianity. That's not what the scripture says. No. No. He's not the one who's sort of up there looking down. He's the one who by his Holy Spirit is here, 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 working in us that which he desires. And it is because of that that this group of people can make these kinds of commitments to say, I will with God's help. We will believe together, knowing that no matter what is, in fact, asked of us, and much is asked, he will be faithful. He will give us what we need, that we might walk in that kind of assurance, that we might walk with that kind of courage. Amen.